God is so good to us, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Trying to get myself slightly organized here. Cindy's away, so I got to figure out how to, how to do everything I need to do. She'll be coming home. Uh, what is today? Sunday. So it'll be Monday morning at 3.54 a.m. So I'm heading down after church. I'm going to stay down in Yorba Linda, get some rest, and then at the crack. It won't even be the crack of dawn. <laughs> just, anyway, I'll leave it there. But uh, I'll be driving to Ontario and picking her up. And then she wants to go to Knott's Berry Farm Tuesday for her brother's <laughs> birthday. Thank you. And then we'll be coming home. So she misses y'all. I talked to her yesterday. She can't wait to get home and see all your smiling faces. You guys look good. Yes, we do. Now, last week, I don't know, but this week you look pretty good. <coughs> I'd like to welcome our visitors today. Thank you for coming and fellowshipping with us today. We hope you have, are having a good time in the presence of the Lord and, and being in fellowship with us. I wanted to share some things. I'm, I'm kind of. Uh, I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to try to keep it short because I got. Uh, once again, I got something early in the week, and I got tons of information, and so I just want to share the the crux of what God gave me. And really, it, it kind of covers two things. You know, we've been talking about the Word of God this whole month, haven't we? How important God's Word is. It is seed for the sower, it is bread for the eater. God's word is, is God's will. It, amen? Amen. That's right. God's word is a lamp unto my feet, it's a light unto my path. The Bible says that he sent his word and he healed them. That's right. See, God sends his word and he heals us. He sent his word in the person of Jesus Christ and he delivered us amen. from our sins. What an amazing God. What a powerful, powerful thing the Word is. And you know, the, the, the thing that I was looking at the other day when I, I was just kind of praying and asking God for some direction, the connection of the Word and faith. And so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to kind of marry the two a little bit because uh, I know we got a study on faith coming up and we still have more on digging into the Word of God. But I wanted to read something before I started because where, where, I felt, where I felt on the beginning of this journey in sharing this week was about faith. You know, as, as a pastor, you look and you see the different things that are going on in your lives, things that are going on in my life, where there's a measure of faith that God is growing us up in. Do you feel that? Now, we're believing God for things that two years ago we would have never even considered you know, facing as a congregation. We're going through things in our lives right now that we probably would have never thought last year we would be in this position as individuals, not just as a church, individually in our lives. And that our faith is growing, it's being increased, it's being strengthened day by day, moment by moment. And so I was looking at that, thinking about what I see with my natural eye happening all around me, even in this, with this earthquake stuff going on. Okay, okay, God, you're shaking your church. You shook the city of Ridgecrest, the Indian Wells Valley, Cyril's Valley. You gave us a good shaking. You woke us up. You got our attention. God, what do you want us to do? Well, God has big plans for us, but here's the thing. We're going to have to respond in faith. We're not going to get away with walking, out, walking this thing out down Easy Street. No, I'm, now what I am not saying is that he's going to make it so grudgingly hard. But God is going to, going to put something in us to believe him for things that we would have never believed before in the past. He's stretching our faith. And I felt like, God, I, I need greater faith. I need greater faith. I'm beginning to understand faith through my ordeals. You know, when Eddie was sharing, um, I remember going to see him. And had he not gone to the doctor, he would have died. He was a very, very sick young man. 
And I, but you know, what, you know what really encouraged me about Eddie when I went to see him in those times? I had just gotten out and uh, I went to see him. And I'll tell you, you did not walk into his room and not get prayed for. He prayed for everybody. And then he recruited me to pray for everybody that came in the room. And so we had a prayer meeting in the 4100 unit over in Loma Linda. And uh, so they knew, they knew what Eddie was all about. But see, there was a measure of faith operating at that time. And God did great and marvelous things. I want to read something that I, that I read that, that began to set me off on a course. It's, a, you know, in your Bibles, some, most of your Bibles have a preface about what, what the book is about, what the epistle is about. Well, mine is, uh, I was looking at the epistle, actually, I was looking at the back of Hebrews, and I came across this uh, little summary or a preface to the book of James. And I want to read this to you because it challenged me about my faith. Now remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word. The word. So I'm connecting these two, okay? So we're not just, this isn't a, uh, a talk about faith. It's a talk about faith and the word, how they're married together, how important it is for us to get a grasp on that. So this guy writes down, he says, faith without works cannot be called faith. Faith without works is dead. That's what James says. And a dead faith is worse than no faith at all. Faith must work. It must produce. It must be visible. Verbal faith is not enough. Mental faith is insufficient. Faith must be there. But it must be more. It must inspire action. You know, when I, when I read that, I thought, I thought about my life. I thought about other people's lives, the inspiration that their life is because of the way that, that they're believing God. They're living their walk out before the Lord and they're living it out before you and I. How it, ins how it inspires something. You ever, I mean, you ever been around somebody and they're, just their relationship with God inspired you? I know when I first got saved, I had, there were leaders in my midst that were just inspiration to me. I wanted to preach like them. I wanted to prophesy like them. I wanted to evangelize like them. Just down the list, I wanted to do all these things like they did. I wanted to build like them. They were an inspiration to me. And faith began to rise up and I began to understand that I was created for a divine purpose. And as I responded to that purpose in faith, God began to bring me into a greater realm in my relationship with Him. So it inspires. Faith must inspire action. Throughout his epistle to Jewish believers, James integrates true faith and everyday practical experience by stressing that, that true faith must manifest itself in works of faith. You know, it's not enough just to say, I believe God. Right. It's not. It's not enough to say that you know the Bible. It must be active. It must be manifest in our life. Are you guys catching anything here? Okay. Faith endures trials. You know, even this morning as we were praying for Kirk, there's something that has risen up. Has any of you spoken with Joyce at all? I'm telling you what, man. She will totally rock your world. There is such a faith and such a hope in that woman that she is confident in God. She is confident in God. And, and she's, she's not in a place of, of giving up. If God wants to take me, he can take me. If, I, if he wants me to stay, I'm going to stay. I'm going to give him everything I got. But it doesn't matter. I'm where God wants me to be. See, that began to challenge me in my own personal faith. Because sometimes I believe for things that if I don't get it, I'm just going to pout. I know nobody else does that. I didn't get my way. It's like fish. I didn't get what I asked for. So I'm going to take my cards and go home. No, that's not what faith is all about. 
I learned some things about faith when I was in the hospital. And maybe someday I'll be able to share some of those things. Uh, maybe when we do the faith session. But it says faith endures trials. Trials, they come and they go. Boy, do they ever. But a strong face, faith will face them head on. And develop and head on and develop endurance. Faith understands temptations. It will not allow us to consent to our lusts and slide into sin. Faith obeys the word. Wow. See, church, we've got to get the word of God in us. Can I just kind of do a little sideline here? In Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Now, I've been in, under a lot of different teachings about that. You know, they talk about the rhema word, the spoken word. And I don't know about you, but that's always left something mystical hanging around with me. Now, let me, let me pl- articulate what I kind of feel and tell me if it's your experience. But you're going through a circumstance, you need an answer, you have no idea what to do, but you're waiting for that mystical voice to say, David, as surely as I live, says the Lord. And you don't hear that word. And you're thinking, I, I, I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. Because I'm not hearing that rhema word. Or you start fishing and, and scrambling for words. You know, it, it's, it's interesting in that, in that whole study of, of rhema word. It's spoken word. You know, it, it ties into Psalm 1. Do you remember when I was talking to you about how in his word does he meditate day and night? And meditate just isn't sitting and thinking. But it's declaring the word. It's declaring the word. It declares the word and the word enters into us and it becomes part of us. We hear the word again and it becomes revelation to us. We hear the word again and it gives us hope and it gives us faith. And when we face the circumstance, because that word has come in and taken root into our lives, that that word is what comes up, that spoken word that we have heard that has been sown into us comes alive. And it gives us something to stand on. See, I didn't really realize that till I was in the hospital. Do you know I didn't pray for myself? That sounds pretty stupid. It doesn't mean I didn't pray. But see, I had been mulling over the Lord's Prayer for months. And I was thinking to myself, don't pray as the sinners pray. Don't pray as the sinners pray. Don't pray as the sinners pray. But when you pray, pray like this. Because your heavenly Father knows what you have need of. So you know what my prayer was? Our Father, which art in heaven. When I look at Joyce, that's what I feel like. She must be praying that prayer. Because she knows who she belongs to. And there's a faith inside of her that is just rising up. She knows who she belongs to. She knows her life is in the master's hand. And it doesn't matter what happens with her life in the master's hand. She's going to be okay. Because how would be your name? See, I understood that. And that was how I prayed. Did I like the tests that they put me through? Did I like the circumstances? I didn't. But, I, but it, re- it reminded me of who I belonged to. And if he was my Lord, I was going to be okay. And he is my Lord. And it gave me faith to face those things. Gave me faith every day that I didn't feel good. But see, it it was was rain of word for me meditating, speaking those words in times even before, that in times of trouble, his word came forth. Are you hearing what I'm saying in that? Now, I'm not saying a person can't come up and give you a word of knowledge. I'm not saying you can't read something in your Bible and something to light go on. I've done all of that. 
But I know when something wells up of the Spirit of God, of the spoken Word of God that's been sown into me, that has taken root. You know, when it talks about having revelation of the Word, I'll tell you what, you don't have revelation until you walked out what you've read. Till you walk out what you've taught, because without a doubt, you know it works. Without a doubt, you know it's truth. I mean, here's here's something Jesus said I thought was kind of interesting. Different translations say it different. My concordance said it. It didn't fit my theology, but I looked, so I went and looked up the word. I thought, well, that's, it does fit. It's just a different translation. I hope that made some kind of sense. But when Jesus says, if, if my word is in you, you, you abide in me, my word, I'm paraphrasing, my word abides in you, you'll know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I'm paraphrasing a bunch of, the, of, the, of two verses. His word abiding in me. It's really the fruit of my meditation, my declaring his word. Till it gets inside of me. I'm abiding in him. And his word is abiding in me. And I'll know the truth. And in the circumstances of life. I'll experience freedom and victory. Because his word never fails. It is forever settled in the heavens. Faith obeys the word. Church, get the word of God in you. When you come across something that lights you up, because I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to detour from here to go to something real quick. When something speaks to you, stop and go over it. Research it out. Begin to speak it to yourself. Because I came across something earlier this week. And it spoke life to me, and I'm hoping it does to you. Faith obeys the words, the word. It will not merely hear and not do. Faith produces doers. Faith harbors no prejudice. Faith is more than mere words. It is more than knowledge. It is demonstrated by obedience, and and it overtly responds to the promises of God. Faith controls the tongue. This small but immensely powerful part of the body must be held in check. Faith can do it. Faith acts wisely. It gives us the ability to choose wisdom that is is heavenly and to shun wisdom that is earthly. All these things, as you're listening to them, they're in the book of James. It provides us with the ability to resist the devil and humbly draw near to God. Finally, faith waits patiently for the coming of the Lord. Through trouble and trial, it stifles complaining. So after having read that, I went back to the book of uh, Hebrews. And I began to read about faith out of chapter 11. And I want you to, to read this verse with me. It's 11 verse 6. The writer says this, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. See, we're not born into a house of blues, a house of unbelief, but we're born into a house of faith. A people that believe God. Abraham believed God, the father of faith, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. We've been appointed to that house. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. See, when I said I prayed the Lord's Prayer, I acknowledged who he was. My father, I I personalized it, my father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. I personalized that part of the prayer because I know who he is. I have sung that he is the mighty God, counselor, wonderful, the creator of all things. What's that sound? Wonderful, 
No, I can't sing it. Marvelous. All those amazing things in the book of, of Isaiah that it declares about who God is. I've sung those things over and over in my relationship with the Lord. They're in me. I understand who He is. He is my shield and my buckler. He is not my servant and my butler. But He is my God in whom I trust. Hallowed be His name. See, I believe He is everything He says He is. I believe He does everything He says He will do. That God is not a liar. But he is faithful. His word is forever settled in the heavens. It does not return void. He exalts his word even above his name. We sing about the name of the Lord. Awesome. His word is even higher. His word is his authority. So when he says that he is God, the creator of the universe, you can bet on that. You can mix that with faith. You can, you can clearly, freely say, I know that I can do all things through him. Because he can do all things. That if he leads me into something, he's going to finish what he's begun. Because he said it. And he can do it. He must believe that he is. And this was the part that really blessed me. And he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. Remember, we're reading the faith chapter. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I was looking at that word diligent because when I think of diligent, maybe I think small, but I think if you're not diligent, you're slack. You're half-hearted. You're just kind of cruising. You're not really working too hard at anything. And I made it all about that realm. But that's not what that word means. That's actually a Latin word. It was added to our, our vocabulary in the 1400s. It's, it's based from a Latin word. And that word means to esteem. To, to put a value and to love. So it sent me on this quest I wrote this down. He rewards those who diligently seek him. He, re he rewards those who esteem him, who value him, who love him. And I began to ask myself concerning faith and about his word, what do I love? What do I love? When people look at my life, what do they see? See, there was a statement that was made. The things that we esteem, the things that we love, or the things that we esteem are the things that we do. I remember a, a preacher one day saying, there's minors and majors in the things of God. Faith is a major. Faith is a manger. Manger. Ha <laughs> ha! Major. I had a thought and I cracked myself up and I, and I lost it. Faith is a major. Oh, come back thought. Huh. Well, we'll move along. Going back, without faith, it is impossible to please him. But I felt God challenge me. What do you esteem? Are you happy with just being a Christian? You know, we're, we're living in a, in a time, when I say that God has taken us to a new place, I want to I read a verse. Church, God is calling us to this. I wasn't going to share, and then Roger made mention of it during our prayer time, or somebody did. 
Our culture desperately needs to see men and women of faith. We could talk about God all we want. But if we're not esteeming Him by believing Him in the midst of situations, quit trying to save ourselves and allowing God to be our deliverer. Allowing God to show himself strong on our behalf. Allowing God to bless other people through us because he gave us wisdom and knowledge and answers to problems that nobody else has. It says in Isaiah 60, and I believe it is the time. You know, there's times that emotionally we'll, we'll start proclaiming something and And sometimes that's right, sometimes it's not. The question came up a few weeks ago about our culture. How does the church respond within the culture we live in? Now, it's not about Generation X, X, Y, Z, and it's not about that. You can look in our culture today and see things going on that are just unbelievable. Who's influencing our culture? From what I see, it's not us. It's not us. Something else is influencing young people. Something else, someone else, has even been influencing us over the years. To where that culture has even crept into the church. Instead of having a kingdom culture, there's a worldly culture trying to creep into the body of Christ. Church, it's time for us to start leading the culture. It's time for us to be the ones that are living by faith. The ones that are believing, that are steaming God's word. That God's word is truth. That it never fails. That God has the answer for every problem. Quit forfeiting our opportunities. Isaiah says it this way, arise and shine. You know this earthquake stuff going on and you hear these comments like, man, oh, how, how, did, how do they say it? Uh, the big guys sure watching out for them. Oh, there's somebody, somebody going out. Well, listen, I, like Paul, can tell you exactly who that is. When Paul went to Athens, and it has a, a, a memorial to the unknown God, I know who he is. His name is Jesus Christ. And we need to tell them, yes, this place got rocked to its core. Nobody died because God's hand was upon our city. God's hand was protecting you. And he wants you to know this day, that this is the day of your salvation. It's never come closer than right now. And he's asking, will you surrender your life? Will you repent of your sins and turn to him? And experience everlasting life. Experience freedom from fear. Experience freedom from bondage. What an opportunity to rise and shine. For the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And deep darkness. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. Deep darkness to people. But the Lord will arise over you. And His glory will be seen upon you. You're going to look different. We're supposed to look different. We're supposed to look so different it gets us in trouble. <laughs> historically it did right. yeah, it still does we're to look different our countenance is to be different we don't have to eat the stuff that's out there like in Daniel's day we can request vegetables not me <laughs> but we can request the good things to partake of the good things of God we don't have to experience all the garbage that's out there Their countenance was far greater than the others. His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles will come 
to your light. Wow, how many... Have you ever had God send you somebody? I went through years of it. God would send people... I was in... Oh, I wanted to get you out early. God sent me to a... When I worked in a control room in Trona... Only, pe- only reason why people would come to my control room because they had a nice back room. It sat out at the very edge of the plant where, and nobody really cared about it. That's where all the newbies and the new hires with green stripes on their helmets, they stuck them out there till they needed them somewhere else. And they would come and do drugs in my control room. They'd go back in the switch group and they would do the things that they do and they'd come out, you know, hopping, skipping, and jumping, and smiling, and away they would go. And I would pray for them. And then one day, some guy came, and instead of going right through into the back room, he sat down on my bench. He says, can I talk to you? You look like somebody I can talk to. Really? I led that guy to the Lord. Well, the thing this guy was going through involved somebody else. And so after he got saved, he went and told that somebody else, and they came into my control room. And they rededicated their life. They'd been backslidden for years, playing by the world's rules, and got beat up. And was too ashamed to to, to come back to the Father. And I shared with them about the prodigal son about God's unfailing love, that God's attitude towards them had never changed. He always longed for him to come back. Then I have a Jehovah's Witness comes down and says, what are you saying to these guys? And by the way, can I join your carpool? That's probably the real motive. But he ended up getting saved. Can you believe that? He said, I've never heard the things that you've talked about before. And you... God worked a miracle through my hands at that plant. Hallelujah. I've never seen anything like that before. He got saved. See, the Gentiles came to the light. The kings to the brightness of the rising, of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Listen, there's some of you. I've kind of changed gears, haven't I? There's some of you. You may think your, your kids have all but disappeared. They're coming home. They're going to come back. You got a promise here in the word of God. Let me tell you. Declare it. Declare it. Declare it. Declare it. Declare it. Declare it. Get it into you till you believe it. And then you can start speaking redemptively, not judgmentally or suspiciously. But you can speak redemptively to your kids, to your loved ones. It's time to rise and shine. The church, we have to esteem, we have to be diligent. In God. We have to be diligent in our faith. We have to be diligent in our commitment to His Word. We need to be, we need to be diligent in our commitment to his, his will and His purpose, to what He's doing. There's things that our culture has said think, here's one church is an option. You know, they say statistically, people go to a church twice, twice a month, and that's, that's, that's their. That's their church. That's, it's like, no. Planted. Planted. That's what the Bible says. See, I esteemed his word when I heard that. And I got planted. I set roots. I came to a church I didn't want to belong to. And God said, set roots. Now I'm the pastor. <laughs> See what you get? <laughs> I didn't want to come here. I didn't. God made me. And he said, set down roots. And I did. Because I esteemed the word. 
And God has blessed me immensely. He has blessed my family. And those of you that have set down roots, those of you that have esteemed the word of God spoken over your life, the word that he's brought up from you, you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to close. I just want to ask this question. What, What do you esteem? What do you value? What do you love? God is the rewarder of those who diligently esteem him, that value him, that love him. You know, there may be somebody here this morning and you've been searching and you've been wanting to, you've been, you've been needing answers in your life. Maybe you need to ask Jesus to be your Savior today. You need to become part of the family of God. If that's you, I want to invite you to just open up your heart to him. You know, Peter said in his sermon, when they said, what what do we do? We we hear what you're saying. You're saying these amazing things, but, but what do we do? And he says, repent and get baptized. Repent and get baptized. You'll be saved. You'll experience times of refreshing. You'll understand what it means by all things are new. The past will be cut off and broken away. Your past will not control you anymore. And then God says, I I have a new way of living for you. It's not a a, a law for living. It's the word of life. That is, you eat of it and you get it into you and you speak it and it becomes a part of you. There's a reward waiting for you. The rest. I want to ask, what do you esteem? Do you esteem him more than anything? Hmm. I'm I'm trying to find the words without sounding... um, You're going to need to decide. You're going to need to decide. You're going to need to decide. What do you love? Who do you love? Who do you love? What do you value? Is God and the things of God mean more to you than anything else? I'm not trying to trap or manipulate anybody into religious activity. I'm just asking you, is this stuff real to you or is it not? Does that sound rough? I don't want to sound rough, but I don't want to sound slack. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you this morning. The things that are real, God's word and faith, they're majors. Let's give ourselves to them. Amen? Amen. Father, we're so grateful today. I read where your word is your authority. I think the centurion that says, at your word, my servant will be healed. That God, you, you work miracles through the power of your word. You work miracles through the delegation of authority. God, I pray this morning that we're just not hearers of your word that, God, you would help us to be doers of your word. That, God, even as it said in Isaiah, to rise and shine for the light has come and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed in you. That, God, that we would understand that that is a call to us. Those aren't just old historical words to a, a backslidden Israel that is soon to be delivered. But that, God, those are words to us today. That it's time for us to rise and shine. It's time for us to esteem your word. 
It's time for us to be men and women of faith like never before. That God, that we would not be governed by our heads, but we would be governed by your word. Lord, I'm reminded of the Kenyanism that faith will take you where reason cannot walk. That God, reason will never get us where we're supposed to go. It'll never accomplish what you've called us to do. It's faith. And God, I pray for us as a congregation that we would decide today that faith is the way for me. I'm going to walk in faith. The things that, Father, you're challenging me to do, I'm going to do them. That the conviction I feel right now hearing this word, I'm not going to let it fall off of me when I walk out those doors. But I'm going to mix it with faith and I'm going to live different. I want to be a history maker. A leader of truth to all mankind. We were created for this church. We're created for this. So God, I pray grace this morning on your people to respond by faith to faith and recommitment to your word, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Hope you have a great week. Hope you still like me a little bit. Uh, you know, if you're a pastor and you're in it for a popularity contest, find another job. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I say these things because I love you. I love God. Amen. And, and I see a, a great army go rising up. Like Kirk was saying, there's an army rising up. Let's be a part of that army. Let's not say, oh yeah, those guys did an awesome job. Let us rise up Hallelujah. and fulfill the call of God on our lives. Every one of you. Amen. Amen. Woo!